Good afternoon, and welcome to the um, Debakey Cardiovascular Journal uh, webcast. Um, I'm Mike Quinones, the editor-in-chief of the journal. And today, we are going to dedicate um, the webcast to the current issue that discusses all the new updates in cardiac electrophysiology, particularly a lot of the new technology that is being developed and new procedures. So in 1976, I was a young cardiologist in a military hospital in South Carolina. And I sat the whole night with a 55-year-old man that had a previous anterior MI, had no heart failure symptoms, and started having incessant VTAC. He would go into very fast VTAC, V floater. We had to shock him out of it. He would spend a few minutes in sinus and go right back to it. And we gave every single drug we had in 1976 available with absolutely no effect. After several hours of doing this, the man looked at me in the eye and said, Doc, you've done everything you can. I cannot take this anymore. Let me go. And he died. And I think a lot of cardiologists through the past decades have uh, had that frustration with a lot of patients. And um, in the 80s and subsequently, the field of electrophysiology started to develop very rapidly both in the cardiology side and the surgical side, and a lot of very bright people, some of, many of which you will meet today, uh, joined the field. And the combination of that plus technology and industry, uh, the, the picture is totally different today. And no question in my mind that that 55-year-old man probably would have survived today with all that we had available to offer. So I am delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Miguel Valderrabano, who is a professor of uh, cardiology at Houston Methodist. He's also the head of our division of electrophysiology and has been a pioneer in developing many techniques for ablation of arrhythmias. He will take over very soon and introduce the rest of the speakers. And I'm looking forward to a very, very instructive session this uh, next hour and hope that many of you can be go become updated in a lot of the new things that are coming up the, in uh, cardiac electrophysiology particularly, uh, there's going to be a fair amount of emphasis in ventricular tachycardia because of the uh, severity of that condition, as I just showed you with the patient I had in 1976. So, Miguel, Thank you. take it on. Thank you. So, um, you know, when you asked me to, to uh, lead uh, an issue of the journal on updates on cardiac electrophysiology, um, it became very clear that uh, you know, there's, we had to do something slightly different than we had done before. And the field of cardiac electrophysiology has been driven by technological developments from the very beginning. If you think of it, if you think of EP as being born when Eindhoven invented the electrocardiographic machine, that was a technological advance, and from it, a whole clinical discipline evolved. Um, and I would say that for the past two decades, many of the advance, advances in electrophysiology came <coughs> from engineering and advances in technical gadgetry that we use to understand and treat uh, cardiac arrhythmias. However, uh, when I was reflecting about what to, what to put in this update issue on EP, I thought we could make it a celebration of the basics, a celebration of anatomy and physiology as the true foundations of, of electrophysiology. Sure, along with uh, technical developments, there's no doubt, but um, rooted deeply in, in basic concepts of anatomy and physiology. So in this issue, we discuss <coughs> novel treatments uh, for, for atrial and ventricular arrhythmias, some not so novel, but at least uh, still there, and valuable treatments of cardiac arrhythmias based on, on capitalizing the opportunities that normal anatomy give us, normal anatomy and normal physiology. So as we will discuss uh, with the authors as, as in the next hour, uh, we will see how uh, new treatments have evolved uh, around capitalizing the coronary venous anatomy, something that we have been very interested in. Uh, new treatments have been evolved uh, capitalizing on knowing the anatomy and physiology of the cardiac autonomic uh, nervous system, something that is increasingly recognized as a vital component on the mechanisms of cardiac arrhythmias. So um, with, with that as an introduction, I will move on and um, uh, bring our, our uh, 
one of our first uh, speakers, um, Dr. Frank Bogan from Michigan, who was kind enough and uh, to write a review on his experience on coronary venous mapping and catheter ablation for ventricular arrhythmias. Frank has been a leader in the field of VT for many years, probably ahead of all of us in this issue, uh, making uh, seminal contributions on the mechanisms and the diagnostics uh, uh, tools uh, to discern mechanisms of ventricular tachycardia, and has also been interested in the coronary uh, venous system uh, as an approach to aid in the treatment and diagnosis of ventricular arrhythmias. So welcome, Frank. Thanks, Miguel. All right, so um, in your paper uh, uh, that you wrote kindly for us, you show us our, your experience in um, mapping um, coronary veins uh, for the, uh, for the uh, uh, treatment of ventricular tachyarrhythmias. What was the motivation uh, that you had in mind when you approached the coronary veins for this purpose? Well, quite a bit of arrhythmias originate from the epicardium or intra, from an intramural location, and we cannot really reach those areas from other vantage points than the coronary venous system. As you know, the coronary venous system gives us access to the basal part of the epicardium and to the proximal part of the intramural um, septum. So we can access both areas, and both of these areas are important for arrhythmias in patients with structural heart disease and patients without structural heart disease. Um, we, um, in the around 2000, in the early 2000s, we, we started uh, mapping these, uh, we started mapping the epicardial idiopathic ventricular arrhythmias with a, a subxiphoid approach and um, because that was, that's the approach that was described in the literature and um, in other papers. And we failed in, in, in the patients, in the majority of patients using this approach, we failed to eliminate their epicardial arrhythmias. We then looked into um, the anatomy a little bit closer using um, um, CTAs and um, easily demonstrate that the anatomy is not in favor of doing a, a, a zepxiphoid procedure in patients of idiopathic um, epicardial arrhythmias, predominantly because of the fat pad that's located in the basal aspect of the, of the AV groove that was at a distance of um, one plus centimeters from the um, from the basal myocar um, myocardium. Much closer we were when we were inside the coronary venous system or in the um, endocardial mitral annulus. And so we shifted based on these, based on that experience, we completely shifted our approach in these patients to an approach where we incorporated the coronary venous system to allow us, to allow us num two things. Number one, the precise location of the site of origin. And number two, allow us to potentially ablate some of the patients from the, within the coronary venous system and eliminate the arrhythmias if, they, if the locations were at a safe distance of the coronary arteries. Often it is not, and um, still we are able to eliminate the majority of these arrhythmias based on the knowledge of the site of origin. If the site of origin is at a close distance to other anatomical areas like the left ventricular endocardium or um, the aortic um, the sinuses of Valsalva or the RV outflow tract or the pulmo pulmo um, pulmonary artery, we may be able to reach the site of origin even without the blading at the origin of the um, arrhythmias. So that's kind of the, how we went back, how we, for idiopathic arrhythmias, especially how we came to map the coronary venous system. So from, from the technical standpoint, when you, when you determine that the site of origin is best mapped uh, through a coronary vein, uh, that's not to say the site of origin is the vein, but that it's mapped through a coronary vein. And, and if, if the best signal 
uh, suggesting site of origin is from a vein. Um, tell us about the approach for radio frequency delivery within veins. Do you, do you, what are your concerns? Is there any concern of collateral arterial damage if you're in the anterior interventricular vein? And how do you would approach uh, delivery of radio frequency with a standard catheter? Yeah, so your, your point is well taken. The, the arrhythmias do not origin, originate from the veins. They origin from the myocardium, obviously, but the veins allow us to get close to the site of origin. Um, so th before we do any ablation, if we have identified the site of origin, um, we want the site of origin is identified by having the earliest activation time that we have, in addition to a matching pace map when we stimulate the site um, and then we know we are very close or we are at the site of origin. We may not rep, um, be able to replicate uh, the pace mapping morphology 100%, but at least we can get a sense whether we are quite close. So once we are at that location, we inject the coronary arteries to make sure we are at a safe distance from the coronary arteries, meaning about more than at least more than five millimeters at a distance of an epicardial um, coronary artery. And if once we have made that determination, then we um, deliver radio frequency energy. Typically, we start with uh, 15 watts and like to achieve an impedance drop of about 10 ohms while we deliver radio frequency energy. Sometimes we have to give, we have to increase the, 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 the speed of the fluid delivery. We use irrigated tip catheters for this application, obviously. Um, in order to avoid uh, a rise of impedance. But those are, those are the essential components to be used. Favor the use of uh, half normal saline in situations like this? Yeah, we use half normal saline for most, for most ablation um, procedures for ventricular arrhythmias, including the coronary venous system. <laughs> and how do you if circumvent so, okay. Yeah, if so, one has to be careful of of the impedance and um, in order to avoid a steam pop. Um, so we have to keep a close eye on impedance while RF is delivered. And your, your cutoff for proximity with coronary arteries, you mentioned five millimeters? Five millimeters, yes. So, um, I mean, these are, these are incredibly challenging uh, situations where even if you map, if you try to map intramurally, you may get a worse signal than the one you get in the true epicardial aspect of the vein. And, you know, as you know, we've used uh, alcohol in situations like that when you're intramural, but delivering um, any kind of other than, a, other than radio frequency in the epicardial aspect of a coronary vein can be challenging because of, of, of the um, proximity of, of coronary arteries. Have you guys had any experience of, of acute closure of a, of a coronary artery uh, during RF delivery? No, but not not really. We have had some um, um, one patient that comes to mind. It was not through the coronary um, venous system. That was from epicardial approach. We were quite mm -hmm. close to an OM branch, and there was a stenosis at the end of the procedure. And so we um, so there was no occlusion, but um, we had to. And it, the suspicion was this was due to edema. Um, no intervention was performed. He had a patient had a recap six, a uh, few months later and the, the vessel was fine at that time. But we have had patients, we have a lot, we have a lot of patients from um, other institutions who have had failed procedures. And in the, some of these patients, there were occlusions of the LAD, one patient, of um, a ramus branch in another patient, um, of the coronary reason system yet in another patient and another LAD occlusion. So one has to be really careful when one applies um, radio frequency energy in, in, in adjacent to um, adjacent to the LED or other um, larger um, epicardial vessels, so yeah, it can happen. So we have had our some experience. Our experience too. It is it is something that happens rarely, but it does. It can happen. Uh, we've had a case of a diagonal branch of the LED that that closed on us. Um, and it's just, um, you know, it's, it's incredibly frustrating. Uh, tell us a little bit m about uh, thermal mapping or, or injecting uh, cool, cool uh, saline to, to test the value of a given artery or a given vein, sorry. Vein, yeah. 
Yeah, we, we used to do this. Um, um, we noticed that when we were speeding up the rate of um, fluid delivery in through the irrigated tip catheters that sometimes they seem to suppress the arrhythmias. And um, this appeared to be predominantly the case uh, for intramural arrhythmias, not really for epicardial arrhythmias, hmm. but for intramural arrhythmias. So we took advantage of that and um, used that for um, for as a as a diagnostic um, tool to see whether this um, helps us to um, make the uh, make upfront the diagnosis of intramural origins. And it seemed to it's not perfect, but it seemed to um, suppress in, especially intramural arrhythmias. And and uh, finally, in in your uh, paper, you show a figure of the uh, music software to integrate uh, information from the CT uh, with the rest of the anatomy. Let me ask you, do you, the, are these um, acquired, these CTs acquired specifically in the venous phase or just uh, the, standard, uh, the standard protocol for CT coronary angiogram? We use the, those well, from a standard protocol. Um, from a CTA, there was no specific preparation for it, but now we use a more specific preparation that gears towards um, imaging the coronary venous system in order to bring them out a little bit better. You can, you can, in my opinion, once you know what you're looking at, you can easily follow the great cardiac vein and its um, branches down to very small branches. But sometimes when they are very small, you may it, it, it's better to to visualize to visualize them with a special protocol. Well, that was very very uh, educational, instructive. Thank you for sharing uh, your experience with us, and uh, we'll move on. Thank you, thank you for your time, Frank. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks. Okay, so we're going to move next to discuss. Um, an old topic that never really becomes old, which is the surgical treatment of uh, ventricular tachycardia. And, and we are very fortunate to have one of the leaders and pioneers in, in, the, in this field, uh, whose experience goes back several decades in surgical treatment of, of ventricular tachycardia. And I will preface uh, this, his uh, contribution to this discussion with, uh, with a, a patient experience that we, we dealt with maybe three or four years ago, patient with a large um, anteroepical infarction and, and a big LAD infarct with a completely aneurysmal apex and incessant uh, ventricular tachycardia that we had been able to control with, with antiarrhythmic drugs for a period of a couple of years, but then uh, presented back with, with VT and we tried to do an ablation um, it was clear that probably most of the circuits were in the subepicardium uh, because it really didn't, in, our endocardial ablation didn't really make any impact. And uh, out of desperation, I, I called Dr. Lori and, you know, you know, usually when, when it comes to uh, getting a surgeon to help you, to bail you out, uh, out of an emergency, it's okay. But when it's not an emergency, many times we don't get uh, uh, an enthusiastic response. And this was quite the opposite. Dr. Laurie came, saw the patient, told me 95% success rate. Uh, and he quoted this number to me and to the patient. And sure enough, I did a work of art re resecting the, append the apex and the aneurysm and fixing the patient. So, Gerald, tell us a little bit about your experience um, with uh, VT ablation surgically. Well, thank you very much, Miguel. Um, really enjoying this session. Uh, this, the, the major uh, etiology of uh, VT that we treated in the early days was, of course, ischemic heart disease. And this was in the era before uh, acute interventions in, the, in terms of thrombolysis and or angioplasty. This was even before the days of angioplasties. So we'd get a lot of these people with uh, uh, large left ventricular aneurysms and VT. And um, the uh, time era spans from the uh, early 70s onwards. And the first uh, approach to these people, of course, was 
an attempt to relieve the ischemia in these people who are having a lot of BT by doing uh, coronary bypass. And early on, we found that this was very uh, unsatisfactory because it, although in the, in, the, in the very acute phase, VT would sometimes respond in the chronic phase, uh, VT uh, almost always would not respond to relief of ischemia because unbeknownst to us at that time, the site of origin of the VT was a fibrous uh, uh, scar in the ventricle uh, producing the reentrant circuit. So uh, we then moved on. Uh, we were doing left ventricular aneurysmectomies fairly commonly in those days be, uh, just because of hemodynamic reasons. And we did notice that about 40 or 50 percent of uh, people with VT would be cured by the ventricular aneurysmectomy. So this gave us some hint to uh, pursue uh, maybe uh, uh, looking further into the interior of the ventricle and uh, removal of scar tissue. But it really wasn't until the uh, beginning of uh, endocardial catheter mapping in the 70s and late 70s and early 80s that we began to get data very suggestive of the fact that the uh, VT was not coming from the fibrous rim of the aneurysm, it was rather coming from the transition zone between the uh, normal muscle and the transition into the uh, uh, aneurysm itself, uh, which was primarily a transition between no endocardial scar and then getting more and more uh, deeper and deeper subendocardial scar until finally transmural scar. And uh, really the first out of the gate with a, an actual practical uh, operation for this was uh, the group at the University of Pennsylvania uh, with Mark Josephson, who uh, showed that uh, the areas of removal of the subendocardial scar correlated with uh, endocardial mapping produced about a 70% cure rate. So it was around this time that uh, uh, Dr. Christopher Wyndham was recruited and we began our first uh, EP program at the Methodist Hospital in uh, 1980-81. And uh, so just like uh, Mike uh, Kenyonis described, we started seeing uh, quite a flood of referrals of these people with intractable VT in the ICU with low ejection fractions, often with polymorphic VT. And after all, as he indicated, all available drugs had been given, they would still be having VT. And so we started taking these people to the OR essentially as a last uh, ditch effort. And uh, what we found uh, early on was there were a lot of difficulties with uh, doing uh, intraoperative mapping. The preoperative mapping uh, was often difficult to achieve because these people would be so unstable, they'd go off into these uh, rapid arrhythmias and become very unstable in the cath lab. And with the limited uh, technology available at that time, it was sometimes difficult to get good mapping. But at the same time, we found it was really essential uh, to get some uh, clue from our preoperative mapping, difficult as it was, uh, because it turned out that a number of the anesthetic agents used at that time were excellent antiarrhythmic drugs. So we'd get these people in the OR, put them to sleep, and then start trying to do intraoperative mapping, initially epicardial and then subsequently endocardial. And uh, this is a very time consuming, difficult thing to do. Uh, we'd often have to do it on pumps, so we started getting long pump runs. And around this time, uh, the group at Duke started uh, working on computerized mapping, collection of data from multi point socks and balloons. And we rapidly developed our own. Uh, much more practical uh, sock and balloon. And uh, Matt Pruker, who went on to found Pruker Engineering, uh, developed a computerized mapping system that would take up to 120 uh, simultaneous data points, which meant that we could get 60 bipolar recordings using the sock and the balloon. So this was really a revolution. Uh, we started uh, able to identify sites of origin uh, on the epicardium and the endocardium. We started being able to correlate the epicardial and endocardial maps and uh, 
superimposed and get some sense of the essentially the the slew, the obliquity with which the arrhythmia could go up into the epicardium or down into the endocardium. And one of the most important lessons I think we learned that is still applicable today is the extent and complexity of the uh, arrhythmic substrate, uh, which uh, it's very easy to ablate a monomorphic VT that comes from exactly the same spot every time and is identical in every episode. But many of the patients we had would manifest uh, uh, a range of morphologies and um, we soon realized that the uh, instead of doing a little half a centimeter by a half a centimeter ablation, we'd have to do two, three, or four centimeter ablations to be sure to encompass the uh, site of origin uh, of the arrhythmia. And that one scar, in fact, uh, could produce one arrhythmia, and after ablating, you'd uh, simply uh, redirect the entrance circuit around the same scar, only over a slightly different spot. So the extent and depth of uh, the ablation became important. And this led to more and more a shift from uh, resective techniques to uh, cryotherapy techniques, which would generally give us about a centimeter of penetration. You can see that in the top figure on the left there in the bottom left-hand corner of the figure in color, the cryo lesion going in and ablating through the scar into the normal muscle. And cryotherapy has the advantage of uh, producing no structural alteration. It doesn't affect the collagen it can be used safely over coronary arteries, and it proved to be a very effective uh, device. And our standard probe soon went from the little one you see there to a two centimeter tip, which was actually something used in the gynecological field for uh, ablation of cervical dysplasia. Hmm. Uh, and we found this a very effective uh, therapy, and we'd often use two or three or even four of these two centimeter lesions. And we also found that uh, as the uh, ice balls spread, we got essentially the igloo effect. The ice itself became an insulator. And so it, to get even further depth, we'd have to switch to the other side of the uh, muscle. For example, we'd ablate on the endocardium and then do a corresponding lesion on the epicardium uh, or vice versa. Or if we we're doing septal ablation, we routinely began to do uh, both sides of the septum. And using these techniques, we actually ultimately ended up at the, at the height of our uh, practice with over 90% cure rate of uh, all VTs sent to us. And as we were able to become more selective and more successful, the uh, mortality rate went from the 10 to 15% range down to the 2 to 3% range. And in fact, in people with an ejection fraction over 30% and monomorphic VT, the uh, mortality rate was 1%. So I think the, the lessons we learned uh, with our cardiology colleagues and the amount of data they were able to get from this type of interoperative mapping in multiple centers around the United States, particularly Duke and uh, Dr. Josephson, uh, uh, really brought forward the field and uh, made it uh, clear that these lesions could be ablated. I think uh, that when the casters came, uh, uh, which actually came slightly after the defibrillators came and amiodarone came, uh, there was almost a, 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 a tectonic shift away from surgery and into these other therapies. And I think this was, unfortunately, uh, a little premature in the sense that uh, people seem to only remember the early days when this was really a tremendously challenging uh, problem to uh, deal with. And this was further exa exacerbated by the uh, STITCH trial, which never uh, ever was designed to compare left ventricular aneurysm resection with and without bypass, but rather uh, resecting areas of mixed uh, scar and muscle. So I think there are still patients out there today, just like the one Dr. Valdebarano described, that are very amenable to cure of their VT revascularization by standard coronary bypass and resection of true left, vent left ventricular aneurysms in which there is a very clear line of demarcation between scar tissue and normal myocardium. And in the earlier phases, usually clearly you can see a well uh, 
preserve proximal anatomy of the ventricle and then going out into this big bulbous uh, fibrotic aneurysm on the end. And this is the group that I think uh, in some cases, if catheter ablation is not successful, they should be considered for surgery because they do benefit, true fibrous aneurysms do benefit hemodynamically from resection. So I think we uh, are very proud of being able to be a participant in some degree uh, with a direct VT map directed surgery and then subsequently with the uh, introduction of the defibrillator. We were the first in the Southwest to implant epicardial uh, defibrillator system, which was the standard for a number of years. And we also contributed significantly to our understanding of optimal uh, lead or uh, patch orientation and uh, uh, optimal uh, thresholds for uh, defibrillation. So I think there are still some uh, ongoing lessons to be learned. And I think before you give up on some of these people that have well-preserved basal left ventricular function and a big aneurysm and heart failure and VT, just stop and think for a second is it possible that these could be amenable to surgical therapy? Gerald, that was, that was amazing. Um, it is humbling to see that many things that we take for granted now in, in EP and we take, uh, we believe were our contributions were actually surgical contributions. You mentioned, of course, Pruka. Uh, most, of the, most of the junior fellows that we train are used to seeing Pruka systems everywhere and they don't know that it was actually uh, a surgical co-development between you and Matt Pruka here at Methodist. Uh, you mentioned also doing more extensive ablation to eliminate all substrates of VT, all different uh, reentrant circuits. That's something that only now in the last four or five years in the percutaneous ablation world has become apparent. Uh, so this is an area where um, the field owes a lot to people like you, uh, Gerald. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll move well, on. Thank you, Mike. We'll move on to uh, our next uh, speaker, which is uh, Ray Chihara, is a thoracic surgeon here at Methodist, with whom we've had collaborated in a few cases and, and uh, learned from each other. I guess I have learned from him. Um, and uh, he wrote um, a review on the role of sympathetic innervation for uh, ventricular arrhythmia. So, Ray, how, how did you get interested in this field and, and where do you see its value? Well, I think uh, in my fellowship at Emory University, we were just starting to kind of look at this and, and start doing sympathetic denervation for, especially for people with uh, electrical storm. Uh, you know, we had a, an, an interest in this because we were already doing this for hyperhidrosis. Uh, and the way we were doing it, uh, you know, which we were actually just dividing at the rib levels when we were doing this. But, uh, you know, after further kind of looking at the different studies, uh, realized that um, we should actually be taking out not just uh, the rib levels, but actually taking out the entire nerve, starting with the lower half of the stellate ganglion. Hmm. So that's what kind of got me started uh, in terms of my interest in this. And uh, since then, uh, you know, we've worked together and, and did some some work on this. And, and, and really, uh, I think there's been a resurgence in interest in this topic because uh, I think at first, uh, you know, we were treating this with medications and, and also catheter ablation techniques, but then there are these people who just continue to have arrhythmias despite, um, you know, these treatments. And a lot of the literature for this was also in the pediatric patient population. And I think that uh, a review needed to be done in order to kind of further elucidate what's going on in the adult patient population. Um, also, uh, some, of the, some of the factors that um, uh, in, in terms of the sympathetic uh, stimulation uh, type things that we're finding in pediatric literature, uh, I think is also going on in the adult field. And that was something that was not really addressed. So in this study, we looked at, um, you know, we did a, a review of the literature, available literature uh, to look at uh, the different indications that were used for adults, uh, which included uh, multiple different uh, indications. Um, there was uh, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy as one indication, sarcoidosis, uh, electrical storm, uh, chagasic uh, cardiomyopathy. Um, and so ischemic and uh, non-ischemic cardiomyopathies were also uh, in, you know, used uh, as indications for this. But really, it's, there's been no kind of randomized control 
study yet um, that kind of proves the efficacy. Um, however, there's been a lot of uh, data retrospectively looking at this uh, showing efficacy. Uh, I think it's a pilot study led by UCLA uh, looking at the role of concomitant, routinely concomitantly doing the uh, sympathetic denervation at the time of VT ablation. And the way I see this, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I see the, the role of uh, the sympathetic denervation is kind of one kind, one type of role is in patients that have, for example, long QT syndrome. This has been established as a, as a primary therapy for a lot of patients with long QT syndrome where the, the physiologic modulation uh, created by the sympathetic nervous system on the myocardium uh, makes a patient with long QT more prone to having arrhythmias. And even though you don't cure the mutation that generates a long QT, you eliminate that modulation that makes them more prearrhythmic. Uh, and in that scenario, uh, sympathectomy is the primary therapy. Uh, as opposed to in, in ischemic VT or VT storm, where we know the mechanisms of VT uh, are very well worked out. This is re-entry in most cases, and we can delineate the entire circuit and, and device local therapies for it. But the clinical dilemma, the clinical situation of a patient going into VT storm Monday morning, more likely than on Saturday, uh, um, when the substrate is the same, uh, that illustrates the role of the sympathetic nervous system modulating arrhythmia susceptibility. So in that scenario, obviously, you never, you have to treat the local, the local circuit, right? You have to treat the myocardium and the primary myocardial disease that generates a VT circuit. Uh, but in that, in that scenario, eliminating the modulation that makes it more or less active is where, it, where sympathectomy uh, plays a role. Do you, would you agree with that? Uh, I do agree with that. Um, you know, I think that the sympathetic nervous system is, uh, I think, definitely involved. You know, I think this uh, whole arrhythmia uh, area is, is uh, very complex and not just the sympathetic system, but also the parasympathetic system, I think, has a role as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, probably a little bit less known in terms of the parasympathetic system, but uh, in terms of the sympathetic system, we know that uh, remodeling does occur after patients uh, have heart failure. Um, and for example, in Chagasic disease uh, or Chagas disease, we know that there's you know decreased um, number of nerves basically stimulating the nervous system in the, uh, in the sympathetic uh, system, and we think that that may also, in addition, affect uh, you know how in Chagas disease, how ventricular arrhythmias occur. And, and I think that uh, this is just one aspect, uh, an area that can be modulated in order to assist with uh, kind of preventing further arrhythmias uh, in this patient population. Uh, I think that the other thing is uh, trying to determine which patients uh, will be helped with this. I think that, um, you know, with, it, you know, in this study, basically, there was, you know, in terms of heart failure versus not heart failure, uh, structural heart disease causing things and stuff like that. It seems that it's been used in kind of all these situations and it seems to assist. But uh, I noticed that when I was at Emory University doing this, that there is some risk in terms of patients who have really, really low EF. And I think that that's an area that needs to be kind of figured out that um, I, I think if your EF is kind of under 30%, I mean, I think that patient population may not necessarily benefit from this, but yeah, I think that's an area that needs to be looked at further. Sympathetic denervation at the, at the time, say, for example, of an acute infarct. Uh, there, is, there is animal models that, that really involve very, very importantly the role of the sympathetic nervous system activation as a driver for adverse remodeling uh, after an infarct. So you wonder whether uh, making, implementing these therapies at the time of an infarct could have downstream favorable effects in, in impacting less remodeling or less, less arrhythmogenesis in the follow-up. Anyway, thank you very much, Ray. Uh, I think our next in the schedule is Dr. Wolf, who um, has been leading um, our, um, sorry, um, our uh, surgical AFib ablation program, um, and is joining us in the studio here. Um, Randy, welcome. Thank you. So why don't you tell us about uh, what you wrote and your experience in AFib ablation with your surgical approach? 
Yes, uh, thank you for the introduction, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to join you all here. Uh, let me make sure my microphone is on here. Here. Well, it's a pleasure to join you this afternoon, and I'll summarize some of the surgical aspects of atrial fibrillation, as some of us know they've been around a long time. Initially, uh, uh, AFib was treated surgically uh, before 1998. It was primarily a surgical procedure, and then it flipped back to a, a EP procedure on the discovery of the, the pulmonary vein involvement with AFib. Uh, my approach has uh, been fundamentally different in that uh, if the drivers are in fact the nerves, uh, and we were just talking about sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves, uh, then maybe that's a good place to start. So my research has been around going directly to the nerves which are on the outside of the heart, uh, not the inside of the heart, as opposed to uh, focusing on the pulmonary veins which are on the inside of the heart. That's the minimally invasive approach. There are uh, still open surgical approaches. Uh, that should be used whenever a patient has open heart surgery and has atrial fibrillation. The Society for Thoracic Surgeons has tried very hard to get more cardiac surgeons to diagnose the AFib in patients who are going for open heart surgery and to treat the AFib at the time of surgery. It's been shown in longitudinal studies that that's beneficial and adds years of life to the patient who has both their surgical procedure for valve or bypass, and their AFib procedure concomitantly. There are several minimally invasive procedures for patients who do not have coronary disease or valve disease who would not ordinarily go for surgery. And I divided those in this, uh, in this short article into minimally invasive procedures and hybrid procedures. The minimally invasive procedure that that I have worked on uh, came to be known as the mini maze. That was named by a patient, uh, not by me. Uh, but essentially what it involves is attacking the nerves on the outside of the heart. These are called the ganglionic plexi, which are 80% mixed sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves. We believe we're attacking the drivers of the AFib. This has been shown in the animal model to be true. But also, uh, isolating the pulmonary veins, but on the antrum, not on the veins themselves. Are, our, are the slides working? If they are, I could go to a slide and, and show you that. Oh, I need to share the screen. Oh, really? Because I'm here in the, I'm hooked up directly here. I don't think I should have to share the screen. Um, I think you should be able to go uh, directly to my my laptop, there you go, yeah, I don't have to share the screen. Uh, this is just shows, I wanted to mention that this is what patients are asking for. Uh, and, and these are almost in order of what I hear from the patients who have AFib. They wanna get off their blood thinner, they like to decrease their chance of stroke, and they'd like to get in rhythm. And the therapy that uh, really got us starting, this is back in around 1999, 2000, was to make sure that we did isolate the pulmonary veins, but with a different approach from the outside-in approach as opposed to a catheter-based approach, which is the inside-out approach. And we found it very safe to use a clamp that eliminates all the blood, all the infinite heat sink, and makes a line through the heart in about 12 seconds. And this is what, this clamp then became the number one used device for surgical AFib, both the open procedures and the minimally invasive procedures. Mike Hooven and I developed this clamp in Cincinnati in 1999. And the idea was to get outside the drivers of AFib and make a transmural lesion. And we did show in the animal model many times that even though the clamp is applied on the outside of the heart, we get beautiful uh, circular lesions on the inside of the heart as well. So this, this sort of thing took over for the open back in uh, oh, about 18 years ago. And then in 2003, we started using this approach for patients who didn't need open heart surgery, who just had standalone AFib. And on the right here, you can see an interoperative uh, photograph, and it shows very clearly the superior and inferior pulmonary veins and the clamp up on the antrum uh, of the atrium. But also, 
we were able, because of this approach, it's very easy for us to close the left atrial appendage. Now, uh, segueing uh, from this last discussion, uh, I believe, along with some other people, that most standalone AFib starts with vagal AFib, and these autonomic nerves are around the heart, and we found that we could test these nerves, we could find the ganglionic plexi, ablate them, and then test them again and prove that they had been ablated, and we wrote an article about that several years ago. So really the approach, the minimally invasive approach that I have taken is multifocal. One is do a good isolation of the pulmonary veins for sure, but also attack the nerves on the outside of the heart, and then lastly, close the left atrial appendage. This is some, there are many, many articles and books written about sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation of the heart. And these are a couple pictures I picked that sort of sum up what we're dealing with. It is a very complex uh, relationship with these nerves on the outside of the heart. These are the nerves that make your hands sweat when you look over the top of a tall building or make your heart race when you're watching a scary movie. Why should your heart race when you're sitting down in a chair? And it's known that these ganglionic plexi on the right here, depicted on the right, are around the pulmonary vein. So it makes sense that a pulmonary vein isolation may stop the AFib, but it also makes sense that the real driver may be these ganglionic plexi. And on the right, that's really uh, what, what's shown there are the ganglionic plexi as mapped by uh, electrophysiology. Uh, last, I just wanted to show, uh, you can understand that our view of the heart uh, through the scope, this is a 10 millimeter scope or one centimeter scope, is very clear. With the current technology, we can see the heart very well and we can do what we want to do. If we want to focus on the left atrial appendage, this is the left atrial appendage. This is the current device that I use here at Houston Methodist to close the appendage. It's a clip. It's sort of like a big hair clip, but it's a lot more expensive than a hair clip. And it fits around the base of the appendage. And we also have transesophageal echo performed while we're doing this. We can see very clearly externally, the entire appendage is, is in the clamp or distal to the clamp. And on the inside, on the TEE, we can see that the appendage is closed. So with this technique, the patients do not have to take blood thinners after the procedure. In some patients, as mentioned in the article, the only thing we do is close the appendage if they cannot take blood thinners. And this procedure is about a 30 minute uh, procedure. So that's, these are some of our results from the minimally invasive procedure. This was several years ago. I do have patients now that are 17 years out that are still AFib free. We can use this minimally invasive procedure if the patient's had ablation or a stroke or can't take blood thinners or has failed other therapies. It doesn't matter what type of AFib it is. And it's something you might consider if you've had an ablation or two or three before going to a pacemaker in an AV node ablation, particularly in a younger uh, a patient. We have had success in those situations. So in conclusion, uh, the minimally invasive procedure is uh, shown to be uh, valuable in another treatment for AFib, and it's something that uh, is appropriate to mention when talking about the treatment of AFib, particularly lone AFib and concomitant procedures where the patient's having some sort of other surgical procedure. So uh, what I've found over the years is some of these AFib patients are the most grateful patients you could ever encounter. So that's a quick summary. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you very much. This was a uh, nice summary and a, and a very valuable contribution to the issue. It's clearly um, one, one aspect of electrophysiology or arrhythmia management that uh, we, all, we, we need to have as part of our program. Um, and it definitely can achieve very, very rapid pulmonary vein isolation. There's no, no doubt about it, and, and we're glad to, to I, have you. I think I should add one other thing that, that pulls everything together. Um, in some places now where they do the minimally invasive surgical approach, they are uh, doing a follow-up EP study at six weeks. I've been going a little bit longer, waiting six months to a year, after, and, and if they can't get off antiarrhythmics, if they're still having fibroflutter, then going to the EP lab. And we found that to be very successful. 
Yeah, there's it's a there's, hybrid approach. There's I no guess. doubt. Yeah, there's no doubt that that um, like you described the the healing and the remodeling that goes on after you create pulmonary vein isolation. Um, it, it is ever evolving, and and sometimes you see sometimes we see patients that have been done very well for years after a surgical ablation or a catheter ablation, and they come up with with focal tachycardias mm -hmm. from who knows the septum is something we're seeing. Uh, there's no doubt that the disease of AFib is is very complex and and you can achieve you can eliminate the rhythm the rhythm disorder by your procedure um, or with a percutaneous or whichever procedure you do uh, sometimes there's some disease process that's still going on that may not show up as as AFib anymore but you may get focal tachycardias and, and re-entry tachycardias around the mitral valve or others that may need additional work. There's no doubt that um, since the, descri the description of pulmonary vein isolation years ago, it's, uh, it's, it's been a huge success and, um, and made a huge impact in, in patients' lives. And approaches like yours are definitely worthwhile. I guess my point is that <coughs> as clinicians, don't give up if after four or five years from a procedure, the patient has another arrhythmia. Yeah. That doesn't mean you should give up. No, I think you no. should get another uh, mapping. Yeah, this, because that's, oftentimes that's exactly it's right. successful. And usually, and usually, I mean, this is a matter of patient education. Usually patients don't, don't have a problem with that. I think we okay. need to move on. I don't thank know you. if we have, the, thank you. Uh, I don't know if we have Dr. Santangeli. Um, he is, about, he just texted me, he is about to connect. In the meantime, um, we can go over our own contribution here on, in this issue, which included um, the use of alcohol ablation. So I have uh, with me two of the co-authors, uh, Dr. Lador, uh, just sitting in the, joining me in the desk, and Dr. Dawari Boko. So um, I'll start with you, Akanibo. What's, um, tell us a little bit about the double balloon approach and how, how that can help. Well, um, in cases of, you know, alcohol delivery into a vein, we find that for uh, long-term and acute success of this procedure, you have to have, you know, good signals within the vein and you have to be able to, uh, can the vein has to be amenable to cannulation. But sometimes we find that uh, if you have a large vessel where signals or the best signals that you have are proximal in the vein or you have collateral uh, uh, drainage of that vessel, it becomes very challenging to deliver um, ethanol at the, the target um, area. So with the balloon, double balloon strategy, we've been able to you know, give a more targeted delivery of alcohol into uh, the myocardium and um, we've, we've got pretty good success with this technique. Uh, yeah, I think uh, you know, we're, we're happy with it. It's, it's, it becomes a tool for massive destruction, but <laughs> there's no doubt that some patients benefit from that. So I see we have uh, Dr. Santangeli joining us. Is, is that correct? I saw his face. Hello. Hey, Pasquale, how are you? I apologize for uh, a little bit late. Uh, Thanks for joining us. So no problem. Thank um, you for having me. You wrote a review with your colleagues on targeting um, intramural ventricular arrhythmias. Why is this so much of a problem? Well, I mean, uh, we learned that it's a problem mostly uh, from your initial studies, actually. Uh, when you started putting the wires, insulated wires in the septal perforators for alcohol ablation. So, and of course, there is a lot of evidence before then also from the Michigan group, and I see that Frank Baldwin is on the line here. Uh, for intramural arrhythmias, which, uh, you know, there is a variety of way of defining them. Typically, the way we've been defining historically is whenever you have an equal activation from multiple sides, so we assume that the earliest activation is in the middle, that you cannot record. Or when you have a pace map that doesn't really fit in any area that you can map, so it, it, it looks like a fusion complex. And that was reported by Frank Baldwin in a couple of papers on that. And then you started mapping uh, just to reconstruct the history uh, with the septal perforators and you start finding early activity in that region. So we've been interested over the last few years to understand whether we can improve uh, and enhance this uh, uh, mapping in the intramural space by advancing small bipolar catheters, etc. in the septal perforators. And again, we are very uh, limited by the anatomy of the patient, of course, most of the times, because the issue there is that sometimes 
uh, they either don't have a stepped up perforator that is uh, uh, basically close enough to the area of interest, or the stepped up perforator is too small, non accessible, or the angle sometimes can be too tight to accommodate bipolar uh, electrodes. So that's why it is a challenge because we can only map what we can get to. So, and uh, sometimes when we cannot get to that area, because, for example, there is no perforator that will supply the specific area of the intramural space, we don't even know. Uh, what's the earliest activity? We don't even record it. So that's the reason why it's more of a challenge for mapping. And of course, there is a challenge of ablation as well, because of course, uh, our ablation is limited by ablating the surface, which can be the endocardial RVOT or LVOT, coronary cusp region or, or a, a distal coronary sinus. There is no source of energy that selectively ablates uh, the intramural space unless you inject alcohol. Uh, or you can do, in theory, some um, embolization from the uh, arterial branches. But again, so far, we're limited to these two approaches if you were to really target the intramural space. So that's why it's a challenge. I mean, if you look at the outcome, uh, they're definitely worse compared to other types of outflow tract arrhythmias. And uh, the reason why they're worse, in my opinion, is because there is an issue with mapping and also an issue with ablation. So. so it's funny you mentioned the anatomy and the difficulties. When, when we started... Uh, mapping septal veins, um, like you mentioned, we noticed the, the anatomy was not always favorable, so we had challenges with individual anatomy. But I have to say that the biggest challenge we had, at least I had, was my own limitations understanding the anatomy. Uh, you, would, you, would, you would look at venograms and, and struggle to understand uh, the takeoff of septal branches in different fluoroscopy projections. And, and it really, I have to say that it took me a while to understand, particularly the basal septum, so the LV summit. The coronary venous anatomy is, is, is very, very difficult to understand. Um, and even when you understand it, sometimes, of course, the patient has unfavorable anatomy. Do you, um, do you perform uh, venograms in every patient? Uh, how, how is your approach sequentially? for septal mapping? Yeah, I think we, we always, for anything that looks like outflow tract, it clearly is coming from the septal area of the outflow tract. So we use the ECG to guide that. Hmm. Can be RVOT, LVOT, or in between. We always do a CS venogram because again, the anatomy, it's very variable in between patients. You uh, can find septal perforators, but, the, uh, but there is a significant variability. Yeah. And uh, sometimes you're looking for other types of veins that there is some controversy whether they exist or not, like the septal communicating veins, etc. Some of these can be still different branches of the septal perforator. So I think the line, uh, delineating the anatomy is actually crucial. And then, of course, understanding whether you can map some of these branches, uh, because occasionally you can even re reach them because they're too small or the angle is really unfavorable. And the other issue that we have is the integration with the mapping system. So far, we really integrate them mostly with ESI, uh, just like your picture that you're showing there. Mm -hmm. uh, just because, I mean, the reason for that is with impedance, we can integrate these different uh, uh, septal branches within the map. Uh, so far, we're limited with ESI. Uh, Carto, for example, doesn't allow any type of integration. Uh, and, and that becomes an issue to understand exactly what the location is compared to the uh, what we're mapping on the surface. Of course, intracardiac echo helps, but it's not always uh, uh, 100%, because sometimes we cannot really see our small catheters deployed in the septal perforators. Great. And finally, um, tell us about delineating a, a septal substrate uh, with imaging. You recently published a, a great paper in circulation about the characteristics of septal scar by MRI. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, this is really this is a great question. I mean, it's still a moving target. I mean, for many years, we've been looking at... Uh, uh, unipolar voltage mapping, for example, whenever a patient has a normal bipolar. And uh, with those criteria, uh, they're overly sensitive, but are not very specific to understand where the dense scar is in the intramural space. Imaging integration has really made a big difference in this, in, in this scenario, because at least we can see the distance from the endocardium, how thick and how, uh, the scar is, and also the, the overall scar burden. And the other technique that we typically use when we're mapping the surface is the transseptal activation time. We paste from one side of the septum and we record from the opposite side and we target the areas of long transseptal conduction with the assumption that that reflects some form of intramural mm. barrier, which typically is a scar. And of course, the gold standard is always to map directly the intramural space when accessible with, uh, with small catheters. Again, we recently we've been trying to do that. And to use that also as an endpoint, if you see substrate 
in the intraimmunal states with a small catheter, bipolar catheter with lay potentials, lavas, etc. We want to validate that those lay potentials, those lavas are eliminated with surface ablation, and typically from the right side or left side of the septum, and rarely we go for a, a bailout strategies, including a simultaneous unipolar, bipolar ablation when possible, or also alcohol injection. But again, uh, it's still a moving target in my opinion. Thank you. I think we're running out of time, so I think we're going to conclude this discussion. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope we gave enough of a broad range of topics, enough time to, to get an idea of what this issue is going to be, and I hope you guys get to read it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having me. Bye. Thank you. Bye.